There's kind of an old axiom. Do you know what an axiom is? No? It's kind of an interesting word. And I got to realizing or thinking about some of the words that I use that sometimes, because of the generation I grew up in, I use different words that I'm familiar with that maybe you aren't. Axiom is like an axle. You know what an axle is. It's on your car. You know, the wheels are connected to an axle. The axle is what lets the wheels go round and round. <laughs> I'm thinking of a song that goes, that, 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 go round and round, round and round, round and round. I don't know what the song is. It just kind of flashed through my brain just now. And it's like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? <laughs> but an axiom is what makes a thought or a truth or a fact go round and round. It makes it work, so to speak. And one axiom in Christianity, or at least one that I learned, was that if God don't tell you to do it, don't do it. <laughs> in other words, you should be asking God daily what to do. No, really. I mean, there's some people that actually don't have that kind of relationship with God. They maybe have some beads, you know, and they kind of pray over them, you know, and they, they say they're repetitious prayers, and that's okay. They have some candles, you know, and they light them and say a prayer, you know, and that's okay. They uh, have a kippah, you know. You know what a kippah is? No? Okay, well, if you're not Jewish, of course you don't know. But it's like a little round crocheted or knitted or little cap that's put on the head. Kind of the Catholics copied it with the cardinals that you might have seen recently on the television. And the Jews originally are the ones that had it because they wanted to keep their heads covered. So whenever they took off their hat, they still wanted their head covered. So they made these little tight beanies. We used to call them beanies in the old days, you know, way back when. You know, they were little beanies with a little knob on them and a little kind of, well, anyways. The point is, is that some people put on kippahs and put on talis. Talis is like a big blanket that they put over their head, you know, because they feel so ashamed of what they've done that they got to cover themselves in order to pray. <laughs> Maybe you never looked at it that way, but okay. But you see, being a Jesus freak, we know that God's tallies, God's covering over us, the way that God looks at us is His banner over us is love. That's kind of how come we don't really want to go out and do something without asking first whether we should be doing it. Chuck Smith had an interesting way of looking at that. He said something one time in a tape series called the Holy Spirit series and he said that he doesn't get out of bed unless he asks God first <laughs> he's not exaggerating <laughs> frankly I roll over and I hear that alarm clock and I don't want to get out of bed either <laughs> God do you really want me to get up <laughs> can't I just stay here longer uh, you know, Lord, can we just skip today? <laughs> you know, or even pull the covers over your head and try to write the day off because you're depressed or miserable. Except, God has in store every day something to rejoice in because it is the day he's made. Now, you may not know what you can look at in your day to rejoice in. You may not understand the way you should go in your day to be happy about. You may even have every reason in the world to be miserable and to crawl back into bed and to pull the covers over. Or, like I had been at different times in my life, laying in a hospital bed. You know, and you just kind of went, okay, time for meds, boom, and you were out. <laughs> Bingo, knocked out. But the point of it all is that if God doesn't tell you to do something, don't do it. You know, everything we're told to give thanks for, but also we're told to ask, and we would receive. One of the things Jesus meant by asking and receiving was to simply say, Lord, what do you want me to do? You want me to do nothing? I won't do nothing. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. And we are promised, according to the scriptures, that he would whisper to us in a still small voice, that in our ear it would be as though he was whispering and talking to us. For some people, he really is. <laughs> Other people get shouted at. Sorry, Lord, I didn't mean to go that way. But some people, 
it's a feeling, you know, kind of like a peace that passes all understanding, or some kind of uncomfortable feeling, or a comfortable feeling. They kind of go by feelings, but that's okay too. You see, everybody has their own way of relating in some way to God. A lot of it is based upon how they have learned so far what they understand about God. Kind of like the axiom, you know, the axle needs grease to keep it going, you know, because otherwise it'll burn up because if you just keep spinning it, you know, it's going to produce high heat and that heat's going to wear out the parts and sooner or later it'll produce a fire. <laughs> kind of like you see truckers, you know, when they're going down the grapevine, you know, they put on the brakes, you know, and the brakes catch fire. Well, likewise, we all need to be loved to kind of grease the wheels of our understanding so that we could better grasp what God is trying to get at when he tells us to do it his way and not our way. Because you see, doing it his way is a practical reality. Now somebody's going to say, practical? Talking to God is practical? Well, yes, duh. If you reap what you sow, then you really don't want to be throwing up roadblocks or stumbling blocks or any kind of blocks to what you're trying to get accomplished, are you? Now you may not agree that God knows the best way to get to point A to point B or from where you are to where he is, but he's got a lot more practical experience at it than you do. You see, Jesus was alive, so he's lived this life. He lived it perfectly in the sight of God and he said, I will tell you by way of the Holy Spirit telling you what works best and what doesn't. Really? You're going to tell me what to do? You're going to explain to me like how to use an iPad? Something like that. He may bring the right person along and that's also his way of doing things by inspiring others or conspiring the circumstances to bring a person into your life that could help you in some way. He did that with the children of Israel, with Egypt, and with different nations, as well as with different people that had come along. Even Paul, who most people think of as being like, wow, Paul taught the Gentiles grace. Ooh, if it hadn't been for Paul, where would the Gentiles be? Good question. <laughs> but Paul was blinded by the Lord because he really didn't know what he was doing. He thought he was right. He was positive he was doing the right thing. He was even acting out according to what the law said to do. And yet God blinded him and sent him to one humble man that just simply said, uh, you sure you want me to deal with this guy named Paul? I mean, I heard he kills people. You know, so Paul stayed with him a few days and while he recovered his eyesight and the guy prayed for him and, you know, Paul went on his way and we never hear about the guy again. Kind of interesting, huh? wonder what would have happened if the guy said, uh-uh, no way. I know that guy. Man, he's got the wrong doctrine. I'm not dealing with him, Lord. <laughs> you see, that's where we have to yield or we have to find out what God wants. Now, I'll admit, finding out what God wants doesn't mean you're going to do it. <laughs> as a matter of fact, most people I know, <laughs> as soon as they find out what God wants, they go the other way. <laughs> kind of like a Jonah principle. Or they try to, in this case, in modern evangelicalism, <laughs> sadly, we see people rather than do or respond to the way God wants it done or how God says to do it or what God says to do, they interpret it. They kind of change it a little here, change it a little there and kind of make it fit where they want it to. That's kind of like end times, you know. People don't want to deal with this whole idea of that you're living in the last days. You know, they'd rather go along with, well, you know, yeah, the Lord's coming back sooner or later, but, you know, it's not going to be that soon. It'll be later. You know, so that way that later on, you know, God can come back after the children are grown and their children's children and on and on. Or, you know, they go on a vacation or they get their, you know, bucket list done or somehow they get other things in order, you know, like, yeah, I'll take care of that, you know, later, Lord. You know, But right now I need to go do this. You know, I got work to do. I got practical things to do. A lot of times people reinterpret the facts to fit their circumstances. That's not what God said. God said we need to examine ourselves, to prove ourselves, to be approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That way, when we find ourselves 
challenged by circumstances, we're not shocked. We're not surprised. It's not like it was something that we didn't know was coming. As a matter of fact, we probably warned people it was coming. You know, challenges, trials, tribulations. Because that's what Jesus said to expect. You see, Jesus never said to expect an abundant life of peace, happiness, and joy. No, he said you could have joy. You could have peace. You could have an abundant life in this world. But he didn't say it would all be hunky-dory and everything's going to be the story about you and how wonderful your life has become since you gave up your life for Jesus. You see, if it's all prosperity and just getting better and better and better, and you've never been chastised, you've never had to be crushed or broken or denied yourself of some of the benefits and bennies of this world, I really wonder who you're following. Because I don't know, but in the Bible I read, God has a way of changing your understanding into His way of doing things. And that's why every day we need to sit back, step back sometimes, take a long look before you leap into something you don't want to do. Because it may look good. It may feel good. Ooh, You may even have a scripture on it, you know, kind of like you found one. You know, it took a while to find it, but you found it, you know, and now you're standing on it. I'm claiming that one, you know, because I, it took me like three days, you know, to figure it out. But I finally found one that I can prove this is what I want from God, and I'm taking it, no matter what. I don't care what God has to say about it, but I'm taking this one. You know, you know if you're compromising. You know if you're lying to yourself, bluntly. You know how you got where you're at. But the point is, if you're not stepping back at times to kind of re-examine your own life, to look at the way you do things, the way you're relating to people, the way you're evaluating sometimes information that's being presented to you, you're probably deceived. And deception isn't something that comes along and says, hey, you know what? Today, I think I'll wake up deceived. No, deception starts with the little things. You know, we compromise in little ways, you know, taxes or some other way. There's always something in a person's life where there's a compromise. I know at one time, I can bust every Calvary Chapel pastor on this because at one time, Chuck said, hey, don't get all carried away about owning possessions, you know, and getting all, you know, into your Porsches and Ferraris and Harleys and driving them up to Bible college, you know, and showing off in front of all the poor people that, you know, want to get there and come and study. But rather, you know, Chuck was driving just kind of like an old car and, you know, the next day, man, all the pastors were like, <laughs> they split, you know, as far as hiding their, you know, luxurious cars and brought their regular, you know, beaters, you know, to the college. Of course, today it's a little different. Today it's like vogue to be, you know, cool to have a Harley. You know, kind of like, you know, wearing the Hawaiian shirt. Now it's like the younger pastors that have gotten old. Well, I want my bucket list and eat it too. Or is that cake? Well, you know. So, everybody's got a little compromise. But what you do with that is the problem or the choice you make. You suffer the consequences of your choices in little compromises. It's the little things that start to steer you off in different directions than the way that God may have told you to go. If God's told you bluntly, you know, if you sat down and said, Lord, I don't know. You want me to buy this Harley? You know, do you want me to give up this amount of money, you know, that I could be using for something else, you know, for a Harley? And, you know, God said, sure. Praise the Lord. Huh. Good luck with that one. But if he did, hey, I'm all for you, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm glad for you, you know. I can see why uh, God would tell you to buy a kind of like novelty, you know, name brand Harley in order to, you know, like, it's kind of like wearing those $200 tennis shoes. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, that's the best investment you could have. But, hey, there's a lot of pastors, especially Calvary Chapels, that have their Harley because everybody else does. So do we. And they want it to be, you know, the easy rider generation. So now we're making it Christianized. Okay. I'm not one of them, but okay, if, if God's blessed you, go for it. 
Because you see, the difference between having the will of God and knowing the will of God and then doing your own will is simply that. Are we yielding to His will or rebelling against it? In little ways, we start that road and we don't realize until we're down the road how far we've come unless we sit back unless we step back, unless we actually prove out we're living what we say we believe in. Now, it doesn't take a real genius to uh, figure out where I'm coming from. <laughs> you can come over to my house anytime, you know, and knock on my door and walk in and see, yep, that's where he's coming from, <laughs> just like on the videos. <laughs> hey, what you see <laughs> is what you get, and what I say is who I am. I mean, I, I don't change my my way of talking for video, you know, I don't, I don't change for people, you know. Um, sometimes I talk to them about where they're at, you know, like if they're wanting to talk about whatever they're talking about, I'll talk to them for a little while. I can't last very long on some topics, you know, because I just bored silly. But if you want to know whether I'm talking about Jesus <clears throat> all day long, <laughs> ask my wife. <laughs> she can't stand it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've been doing this for, you know. 20 or 30 years, you know, maybe 40 years. <laughs> oh boy. You know, and quite frankly, I kind of like it. <laughs> but you see, <clears throat> that's where you have to come to that place. That realization of your choice of what you want to do. Whether you want to do it your way or his way. Whether you want to step back at times to be able to look at your life and look at what you're doing each day and say, you know, Lord, maybe I'm maybe I'm a little off. You know, maybe I'm maybe I'm going the wrong way. What do you think, God? And that's what we're supposed to do, to not just prove all things about other people, like the Thessalonians did, or those that were the Bereans, you know, or those that you know we supposedly you know sit on the internet and can tell people what's wrong with them. We're supposed to sit back and ask God, what's wrong with us? What are we doing wrong? And you know. God doesn't have a problem telling us that. You see, if you think all of Scripture is just simply telling you what a wonderful life you have, you're not reading the right Bible. <laughs> if you think God doesn't at times speak to you directly and bluntly and say, hey, if you don't hate your family as much as you think you love them, you know, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And that's Jesus talking. I mean, that's kind of like, ouch, you know. You could reinterpret that any way you want to, but to put it bluntly, he wasn't kidding. Because he that isn't for God is against God. That's the way Jesus said it. If you're not for me, you're against me. That's the way it is, period. Uh, I'd like to reinterpret that, Lord. Can I change that a little bit? Maybe they're just kind of like, you know, really don't know. So if we just work at it a while, you know, we'll kind of drag them along. No, they're flat out against you, period. As a matter of fact, most Christians discover very quickly that the first person that you can't witness to is your own family members. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. <laughs> or maybe they do, because in the book of Acts, you see some family members that wanted to hear, the whole household got saved. Now that's cool. I know in my life, when I went to my family, they didn't want to hear it. Of course, I didn't give up. <laughs> and in spite of me, without me, they got saved. <laughs> but believe me, there was some hard knocking you know, going on. Man, I was like, you know, gonna, every day that I talked to them was a, they were gonna get saved that day, <laughs> one way or another, you know. But no matter how much you choose to identify for yourself what you think you may be doing, you'll never know if you're doing it his way unless you're asking him today to show you the way he wants you to go. And that's really why we read Bibles daily, or we have devotionals, or we go to a Bible study, or we hopefully go to Sunday morning or Sunday night and remember all week long what it was that God was trying to tell us to do right, as opposed to do wrong. You see, I'm one of those kind of people that I don't think it's enough to just go on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night and a Wednesday and, you know, whatever. I used to go, when I first got saved, seven days a week to church. <laughs> And sometimes two or three times during the day. It was cool. Matter of fact, most of the time if I wasn't going to a Bible study or meeting or whatever, I was working on 
the ministry of some type behind the scenes, helping somewhere, wherever I could. Man, I was like gaga, go go, you know, goo goo, <laughs> and into it, <laughs> so to speak. And I loved it. You know, I enjoyed that time. And I used to say, well, where'd all the sinners go? You know, because everyone that I dealt with was Christians. Boy, did I find out the hard way. <laughs> Went out and fell flat on my face. But the point is, every day, whether you're a mature believer or a new believer, whether you've been a Christian for 40 years, like I'm coming up on my 40th birthday, or you're just barely getting through 40 days. <laughs> Brain. No, I'm kidding. You know, God wants you every day to discover something about why we do what we do when we say we want to check in with God. It's not always about just getting beat up by the Word of God or, you know, being challenged or taught or trained or learning or blessed or, you know, worshiping all the time. There's something more about all of this and why we do what we do and how we do it. You see, God's so big and so awesome in a lot of ways, we think we know, we don't, that he wants us to keep learning more about him. Because Jesus said it this way. He said, this is life eternal. This is what eternal life really is. It's not about living forever. That's that's easy. You know, that's, that's simple. You know, you could just say, you know, a, a plant without any feelings, which plants do have feelings, by the way, but anyways, a dead rock could live forever and have nothing but, well, second thought, feelings do have, rocks do have feelings because it says rocks crowd. But the point is, you know what I'm saying. Some inanimate object, as though anything that God created was inanimate, but the point is, is anything inanimate could live forever. But you, you have feelings, you have emotions, you have reactions and actions. You have the ability to process information. God wants you to constantly be learning about him because Jesus said this is life eternal and this is life eternal that you should they that you should know him who sent me and let's see <laughs> boy did I mess that one up this is life eternal that you should know him who sent me. you should know him and him who sent me there you go in other words you should know the father because Jesus said look you guys don't have a clue what's going on in heaven he said if I began to explain the things that are going on in heaven you can't even receive the things I'm telling you about what's going on on earth. So how can I explain to you the things that are going on in heaven? And he says, John did the same. He says, he told you about what was on earth and he could have told you what's going on in heaven. You have a clue. That's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 really reminds us we don't lean on our own understanding. We need to get his comprehension. We need to be so heavenly minded. We are all earthly good. Because the reality is you have no clue who the Father is until you actually talk to and he talks to you. That's why we every day read the Bible. That's why we every day study the scriptures. That's why every day we get into a devotion. Kind of like daily life. You know, I really like daily life. I kind of enjoy getting the Word of God put together in pieces, I'll admit. You know, it's kind of like, you know, put together. But it's never daily light as far as I'm concerned. It's never just all, you know, hunky, feely, touchy kind of stuff. It's just the Word of God, and some of it's direct, some of it's blunt, some of it's wonderful. Adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus. Abstain from all appearance of evil. If you be reproached for the name of Jesus, happy are you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's affairs. Be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, it's interesting. I always fascinated because I find a lot of Christians getting into politics constantly and they're posting politics writing politics doing this that or the other thing and they're busybodies they're busy about being a busybody and they don't share the gospel at all they're telling everyone what they need to fight about and argue about and debate about and you know reclaim about and take over about and really get wrapped up about well 
I don't know about you, but I think I just read the Word of God from Jesus. And he says, look, be beyond reproach, beyond rebuke. Don't get involved in that. Don't be a busybody. Don't be a, a caught-up person in the issues and the topics and the situations. Focus in on what's the priority. Eternal life. Knowing God. Knowing the Father. Knowing Jesus. The reality of our situation isn't the situation from Jersey Shores. The reality of our situation is we're going someplace we've never been. We're going to a home we've never seen. We're being prepared for a God we've never known. We know His Son, and we know what He said, but we haven't really known Him intimately and personally as we will one day soon. So we need to be prepared, and God is preparing us for that day. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to make us into the sons and daughters of God by the Word of God. Because if we don't, you won't go there, will you? You won't be found in the Lamb's Book of Life, much less in those books that are going to be opened in heaven. And we need to find out where our name is written. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, but bind them about your neck. Write them upon the table of your heart, so you shall be found favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Mercy and truth. Be merciful. Have grace to those that are without they not knowing what it is that they speak of, because even Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, <laughs> whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Believe it or not, that's from Philippians 4 8. Or Philemon, one of the two. I never get to two. I think Philemon is PHI. But the point is, what are you thinking about? Do you have, as a pastor used to tell me, stinking thinking? Is everything you're thinking about always tearing people down and it's bringing you down? Are you always constantly bringing the world down to your level? Or are you trying to bring people up to? God's level. You see, when you get high enough, really, when you get far enough, when you get actually standing in heaven, some of the little sins that you're so consumed about, you really can't see, can you? As a matter of fact, if you were standing far away from some of the issues that you think you have, they don't look so important, do they? If you were out in space, you know what? What the next government election was going to do, you wouldn't be too worried about. You just want to keep track of your oxygen supply. Because out in space, you need as much oxygen as you can carry <laughs> or regenerate. So, really, the priorities are the priorities. And the superficialities are the superficialities. And God is practical. So, whatever God tells you to do is the most important thing you should do. Because He knows what the priorities are for you. He wants you to know Him in a more personal, intimate way than you've ever known Him before. He wants you to share His Son so that more people in a personal and intimate way would come to know Him as well as be prepared to go to heaven and not go to hell. Because there is a hell and it's been enlarged to fit all the people that are going there. They had to... This amazes me. You know, I'm, I'm thoroughly dumbfounded by those that you know argue about can God send someone to hell? Well, of course, he's God. God can do anything. But the point is this. God had to actually make hell bigger? That blows my mind. Why would he have to increase it when all we had to do was receive it? You know, the, the gift of eternal life that God has provided through the death of his son. It was so simple, and yet somehow, people interpreting and reinterpreting things, the word of God, and the way of salvation to create such a way that people won't accept it today and reject it as being not the way but rather a way to find God or a God. You see, if you have to put a way in front of the way, then you're going to wind up with a God instead of the God. That's the way I think of it. It's pretty simple, you know. Change the article and you know where you're going. If you're looking and following a way, 
you're going to wind up in a hell. <laughs> but if you're following the way, you're going to go to the heaven. <laughs> oh well, you know, you get it, I hope. So, rather than put an A on your report card, I think you might want to be looking at the report card and then taking it back to God and saying, Hey, where can I improve? Not, I'm perfect. Not that I've arrived. Not that I got it all together. Rather, we need to take that step back every day in the Word of God and see where we need to go today with God as opposed to go wing away from God with what we think we should do as opposed to what He wants us to do today. God is practical. He's very real. He's very practical. He'll tell you even to tie your shoelaces. It's recorded in the Scriptures. You open that Bible up someday and you're going to read... Oh my God, it says, tie your shoelaces. <gasps> Michael was right. i got to write that guy and tell him he was right. You know the Bible does say, tie your shoelaces. I know, I found it one time. <laughs> Put on your pants is in there too. <laughs> Guess what? You could lay in bed and say, hey Lord, I'm not getting out of bed until you tell me what next to do. And you may be surprised. He just might do it directly and bluntly and personally and intimately as intimate as you want him to get.